Good afternoon. Hope you all are doing well. I really enjoyed the quick talks. I hope you did too. There was certainly a lot to think about in those sessions. It's hard to believe that this is our final session of this great conference. I have learned so much. There's just been so much for everybody at this conference. I wanted to give you a real example. I'm from the processors group, but yesterday I just broke out of my mold and decided to attend the sessions that were called Show It for the Educators. And I went to the session on rapid hand washing. That was for school teachers. But I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I could send that to my plant manager at a small plant. He listened to it, and he sent me pictures this morning of his plant doing that. And the feedback <laughs> was that the employee said, my hands feel cleaner, this was fun, and let's do this every day. And the plant manager said, we did it faster, save time, and I hadn't told him that the idea wasn't saved water, but he figured that out himself. So I challenge all of you to take something you learned from this conference and carry it forward. But we have one final treat before the conference is over. And this treat is not just for you, but it's for our webcast viewers who are joining us right now. So welcome to all of you that are joining us from your home or office, and we do thank you for joining us. You're going to have a chance to meet the newly appointed Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety, Dr. Mindy Brashears. And then we're going to have a lively discussion on stage with Dr. Brashears, Hillary Thesmar, and Elizabeth Green around perfect communications and the communication storm that can occur when there's a foodborne illness outbreak or other high-profile high food safety topic in the news. My name is Barb Masters, and I know a little bit about food safety emergencies and storms as I've been a food safety professional for 25 years, including 16 years with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Food Safety and Inspection Service. Currently, I'm the Vice President of Regulatory Policy, Food and Agriculture at Tyson Foods, trying to avoid storms, I might add. Our purpose at Tyson is to raise the world's expectations for how much good food can do. Similar to what we've heard the past two days, our mission is for making great food that is safe and satisfying, that starts at the farm and extends all the way to the dinner table. As part of this mission, I'm very proud to say that Tyson is a PFSE partner. And in fact, I have colleagues that are tuned in right now that are very excited for this event. So let's move on to the introductions. Dr. Brashears was appointed the Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety at the U.S. Department of Agriculture earlier this year. She was most recently Professor and Director of the International Center for Food Industry Excellence at Texas Tech University. Her academic research focused on interventions in pre-harvest and post-harvest environments and on the emergence of antimicrobial drug resistance. Her research was primarily in meat and poultry products, but she also did some work on spinach as well. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Food Technology from Texas Tech, a Master's and PhD in Food Science from Oklahoma State University. I know Dr. Brashears very well, and I know she's very passionate about consumer education, and she's very eager to exchange ideas with all of you. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Mindy Brashears. Thank you so much, Barb. Uh, it's, I'm honored to be introduced by someone with such a long and wonderful history with FSIS. So thank you again for that. And thanks so much to Shelley and the conference organizers. I am so excited to be here today and at the conference yesterday as well to meet so many people who have really dedicated their lives to protecting food safety and public health through consumer education. It's such an important topic, and I look forward to getting to know more of you even better. Uh, I have been in my role as Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety for about six weeks now, so I'm still learning everything about the agency and all we have to offer. 
I have been overwhelmed by the expertise we have at FSIS. I knew we had scientists and all sorts of amazing individuals, but as I have gotten to know them better, they are outstanding, and we just we have the best and the broadest. I keep telling people this is like a dream team of individuals, and that's definitely uh, about our consumer education staff as well. Um, my life's work, as uh, Barb mentioned, has focused on research in salmonella and E. coli and preventing those from getting into the food supply. I started my career at the University of Nebraska. And when I was there, I was an assistant professor as the food safety extension specialist. I know we have a lot of extension people in the audience, so you can uh, relate to that. And I would get these phone calls, and I know you've all gotten the phone calls. And I got this one, and you know, it was from an event planner at some small town in Nebraska, and they said, we have the Guinness Book of World Records coming to our town, and we are going to make the world's largest hamburger patty and make hamburgers out of it. And I was like, oh, okay. So instantly I'm in food safety and I'm like, this is going to, they, they want to know how to take the temperature of the patty. You know, and they're explaining everything. It's eight foot in diameter or something. I don't really remember exactly. And it's this thick and we have this fire built and I'm just thinking, okay, how are they going to get the temperature and how many points? And, and you know, I'm thinking about cooking it properly. Well, they get to the end of the story and they said, and we want to know if you have any ideas on how to flip the burger over. <laughs> it was like, what? You know, so, but I think that that is kind of where we are with a lot of the consumers. You think, okay, they want to know how to flip the burger over and we're trying to teach them about food safety. And so um, I think con that's why I think consumer education is so important. So that brings us, oh, I, yeah. I need my slides, <laughs> sorry. And do I have a clicker to change the slides? Okay, go to the next slide. And the next. Is there a way to change the slides up here? Is this it? Oh, okay, thank you. All right, so consumer education. As I already said, I am very proud of the staff that I work with on the consumer education side. You've probably heard from some of them this week, uh, presenting research or just interacting with them. They work, they work so hard on our consumer education efforts at FSIS. I am uh, very excited. Not only do they provide information, but they're interacting and really trying to be proactive in what we do to make a difference with the consumer. One of those things that we are doing is we are partnering with RTI and North Carolina State University to conduct several years and ser several series of re research studies. Now, FSIS is a regulatory branch. We are not a research arm of the USDA. However, we do have the ability to partner with other entities to get some of our research questions asked, and that's what we have done on the con consumer education side. And we're really focused on determining if we're impacting behavior. And so you can see um, on the top, we have completed some uh, observation studies to determine how the consumers are handling product. And then we will follow up with some focus group work as well as uh, web-based sampling. Now you have heard some of this already about the data we have collected, but I really thought it was good to wrap up the conference with this to emphasize our findings again. Hand washing. Well, the news wasn't very good at all. 97% of our consumers improperly washed their hands. I mean, they either did not uh, wash them for long enough or dry them properly, and only, I think, about one-third of them even attempted to wash them at proper times. So we have a long way to go to actually implement the behavior change in hand washing. Food thermometer use. This was not necessarily any better. Only 34% of our participants actually used the food thermometer, and of those, half of them did not use the thermometer or did not reach the proper temperature when they were preparing their food. Again, we have the message, we know how to do it, but it's not getting across to our consumer. 
And then we also observed cross-contamination habits. While they were preparing food, 48%, almost half of them, contaminated their spice uh, containers. 11% of them contaminated their refrigerator handles. And 5% of them cross-contaminated a salad that they prepared at the same time. So that's really a large number of consumers. Again, we know how to do this, but we need to get the message across to consumers. So USDA is tr being proactive in trying to apply some of these uh, results to actually make a difference, but also take it to another level to make sure that we can impart behavior change in the consumer. We have several things that we have going on. One is a media tour. The media tours happen uh, around the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, back to school. These are three areas where we found where there are a lot of food safety issues that occur. So we really uh, put out a lot of information during those times. I think this year we also had a pretty big push around the Super Bowl and handling foods at that time, chicken wings and different items to make sure that people prepared those properly. They are also, we're also preparing or presenting our work at conferences like today. You heard de more details of some of our findings. There's really a lot of information we have out there uh, that we have found in these studies. And if you went to some of our sessions, you, you probably heard more about that. And we're also publishing in uh, peer-reviewed food safety journals as well. FSIS also has a lot of resources, and I, I kind of think, well, everybody knows about this, but, but you may not know, and it's really important because you're the group of people who will be championing the information and taking it to the consumer, so I want you to be aware of what we have available. We have our uh, Food Keeper app. And the Food Keeper app w was developed uh, with Cornell University, and it's an app that really tells you information about how to properly store food and, and the, the shelf life and all those different parameters. We have our meat and poultry hotline, which you already heard about <laughs> briefly. Uh, that meat and poultry hotline is open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time, and we have both English and Spanish-speaking uh, technical experts that can provide information. And then we have Ask Karen. If you go to our website, you will see Ask Karen. And this is basically a database of all of our frequently asked questions that consumers can either put in online or on the app or wherever they are to, uh, to get their questions answered. So these resources are all available to use consumer ed educators and to pass on to uh, your different uh, constituents so they can use them for food safety. So this brings us to our challenges in our next steps. Whenever I think about our message, we all, I think we take for granted, you know, what we know and thinking that the consumer knows um, how to properly cook, how to properly chill and not cross contaminate and all of those different things. And even today, whenever I was listening to the, the talks this morning, uh, I was reminded about washing chicken, and that's been a big deal within FSIS. So we talk about don't cross-contaminate. We, we, we send that message, but I really feel we need to drill down into these messages and find out what exactly is the consumer doing? What is the, the incorrect behavior that could be cross-contaminating? Well, you know, we found there were studies done, and, and there was a study that I listened to this morning, and they were talking about determining that washing a chicken is a, a common habit, and then that leads to more cross-contamination. So that's something that, that maybe we haven't addressed. I think there's a lot of things in those areas. Uh, then I also heard about our chicken livers, and that was in one of the FSIS studies. Uh, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone recommend to use a thermometer to check the temperature of a chicken liver whenever you cook a chicken liver. And I don't know why, I just haven't thought about that, but it's not something that comes to mind. So are there other high-risk items that we're not cooking properly that could be leading to foodborne illnesses? So um, I've, I've spoken to a lot of industry groups, and, and I know some of you in the room have heard me speak many times in the last six weeks. and. Thank you for uh, enduring and persevering with me. I hope my message was a little different each time. But I've, I've been talking to the industry groups, and you know, you always hear the pushback of if our consumer would handle it properly, then we wouldn't get sick. 
but then I'm going back and challenging them saying, okay, what are you doing to educate the consumer? How, what do we need to do to change a behavior with this product? Because the consumers don't know. We're educated, you're educated on your product. Let's gather data and information to know what we need to do in order to impart an actual change in behavior. And that's really what I want to challenge all of you with is to find ways not just to deliver the information, but to really impart behavior change. And I know that that's really been a theme across this conference. And over my time as a Deputy Undersecretary, I really want to champion our consumer education programs and come up with ways that actually impact food safety and public health. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up. We have a vision statement that was set forth by Secretary Purdue at the USDA, and that is do right and feed everyone. And we've added just one word to that within FSIS, do right and feed everyone safely. And with that, I will wrap up and we can start the panel. Thank you very much. I'm Hillary Tesmar. I'm with FMI and I am um, going to be moderating, participating in this panel. We wanted to wrap up the day with some takeaway messages for you. So before I introduce Elizabeth, I want to mention your assignment for right now. There are little cards that are being handed out. Mary Kathleen and I think Shante are going to be handing these out. So this is how we're going to do the Q&A, but we have a specific question that we're asking you. So on these cards, and you can write your answer on the back, um, you can use another piece of paper if you want, but try to be brief and put it on the back. Um, the dialogue question is, the perception of risk is changing, communication of risk is changing. What are you trying that is different for you in conveying risk to consumers? I'm gonna broaden that a little bit. What are you planning on trying after attending this conference for two days so we can make this future? Um, what are you doing now and what are you doing in the future to change the way that you communicate risk to consumers? So that is your, your assignment and put your ideas um, on this card and we will be um, going through some of the, the ideas on stage at the end of this panel. All right, I want to introduce Elizabeth Green, who is the um, Associate Director of Communications for CDC's Division of Foodborne, Waterborne, and Environmental Diseases. And Elizabeth oversees the, um, has oversight of the communications for the division. So she works very closely with the scientists, the epidemiologists, um, the microbiologists in the division, and oversees the communications. She has a full bio in your books, which I encourage you to take a look at. But we are going to be um, talking a little bit about how do we communicate with consumers. So Elizabeth, let me start off with you. Tell us a little bit about your role at CDC um, with the, the division and, and how you um, push out those communications, what your communication goals are from the CDC perspective. So um, from our perspective, we want to communicate with the public in a way that they understand with actionable information so that they can protect their health and prevent illness. Um, so as, as the communication lead for the division, I work with a number of communicators, both um, on my staff and in the branches, and we have a range of activities, some of them related to food, um, our outbreak response branch is, is a group that I work with, as well as waterborne disease and fungal diseases. So a, a, a real range of topics that we talk to people about, everything from hospital acquired infections of a particular um, fungal disease to um, swimming pool safety, contact lens safety, as well as food safety. Perfect. And for the topic of, of this panel and this session is a perfect storm in food safety. So we have heard multiple times and from multiple experts over the last two days about food safety changing, where, where we have new tools, new techniques, you know, whole genome sequencing has been a game changer in pathogen detection and with epidemiology and being, being able to link illnesses that we would have never 
been able to link in the past in distance, geographical locations, and then also in time, in you know, linking illnesses from, from year to year, we can map that now with whole genome sequencing. But this creates challenges for us as communicators um, because, and we have other challenges as communicators because technology is also changing with communications and information travels so fast. So how do we share this information about, um, about food safety from a, an accurate scientific point of view while sharing risk-based um, accurate information and giving actionable steps. And the, and the thing that I'm really asking is, how do we keep that motivation? How do we keep motivating consumers to do the right thing, to wash their hands, to do the basics, to wash their hands, to clean their surfaces and utensils, and to basically clean, separate, cook, and chill? How do we encourage them to do that over and over again when it might not be the most exciting thing to do? So we need to kind of bridge that gap with communications, but then we have all of this other stuff going on with technology, with the, the detection of illnesses in the microbiology field, with epidemiology, with data analysis and connecting the data, and then also in communications with social media. So there's all this clutter out there, but we're dealing with people. And Mindy, you said very, something very interesting in your talk just now about how we assume that we know what consumers understand and that we assume that they're interpreting the information the same as we do as food safety professionals and as communicators. So that further complicates the situation. So I wanna kind of have a, 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 a it's not one question, but I wanna just throw those concepts out to both of you and see what, what response do you have? You are experts, Mindy. You're a, a, you know, an expert in food safety and microbiology. Um, Elizabeth, you're a communications expert. How do we take this and move forward and keep motivating consumers to do the right thing day in and day out? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, even though my, in my family, you know, we, we grew up and we've talked about food safety all the time at the dinner table. So, you know, I know that my children have grown up knowing how to handle food and washing hands and all of those things. And, uh, you know, even, you know, they get to be teenagers and they're like, mom, you know. But, but then I know they still retain the message because they'll, they'll tell me, oh, well, I went over to so-and-so's house and they made chicken and, you know, and they cross-contaminated or, you know, so, so they can see that. And, and I think that that's kind of what I meant about the, the perspective is, you know, when you kind of grow up in it and you, you know, do food safety every day, you know what to do and you forget that the, the average consumer doesn't really, you know, understand how to do that. So um, I sometimes feel bad. I'm like, oh, well, um, you know, do you think maybe you should put that in their fridge or, you know, or maybe you should wash that and not use the same cutting board. But uh, it's not that we're being arrogant about it. It's like we're just trying to keep you safe, you know. So just kind of the one-on-one -on -one conversations. And when you see people doing that and you realize, oh, yeah, not everyone knows about, you know, cross-contamination and washing hands. And so those are the situations where it, it, it becomes real. And we had a parent potluck the other night, which, you know, it's probably everyone in this room, that's your <laughs> biggest nightmare. And, you know, and we were standing there and, and there was a gentleman and, and he was like, I am not eating this. It's been sitting out for three hours. And I was like, oh, you're my best friend. And, you know, but come to find out he owned restaurants and that was even better. I'm like, oh, you know, no food safety. So, you know, it's, it's just a different way of thinking about it. And we need to find out how to relate to the, you know, the individual that isn't trained in food safety. So that's kind of what I meant by that answer. So. I think that that's one thing that's really challenging for all of us because we do know this subject so well is, is to imagine how our message is being received by people who don't. Um, so that, that's one of the things I try and do when I get material to review is to step outside and, and try and pretend that I'm the audience and I know nothing about it and how will I understand it. And I'm curious, I, I did a little bit of walking around outside today and I went down by the lagoon between the two hotels and there was a sign out there and it said you know no fishing no swimming no no waving 
and underneath it, it said, beware of dangerous wildlife. Now, those of you from Florida probably know the answer, but I'm <laughs> curious, show of hands, any, anybody know what that sign is warning about? So, okay, yeah, a few of you do. Okay, I was on an island in South Georgia a couple of weeks ago, and there's a similar sign, except it says, be aware, alligators are present. Um, that's very different. You know exactly what the risk is, and all of a sudden I'm kind of you know, looking around and um, being told, oh, don't worry about the alligator in the pond. He's only five feet long. He's never bothered anybody before. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Didn't help to read a few days later that somebody had found a 13-foot-long, uh, 700-pound alligator in a ditch in South Georgia. Um, wow. But sometimes I, I wonder if, if the communications are as clear as they could be just because we assume the audience knows something that they don't. You know, it's perfectly obvious to us that we're warning about alligators, and to them, maybe we're not. Um, but part of the, in addition to using as clear of a language as possible and really trying to step outside your knowledgeable self and look like somebody coming to the material without knowing about it would regard it, um, would, be, would be to consider how you're conveying the message and knowing that being a trusted source of information is going to make people a lot more likely to pay attention to your risk communication messages. And if you're not that trusted source, are there people you can work with who would be that trusted source? One thing we see a lot of when, say, a posting goes up about an outbreak and it's on social media, you know, we'll, we'll get comments on there from people who, um, you know, not my brand or this is my favorite ice cream and it would never do this and I'm just going to keep eating it anyway. Um, but then you see a lot of people who are tagging their friends. And so those are your trusted messengers. Those are the people who are conveying the message. And if it shows up in your Facebook feed and it's from your friend instead of maybe from an agency that you're not so sure you want to hear from, that, that gives it more weight with people. Um, so that, that's one of the ways we think is, is helpful to approach um, using social media, but also knowing who your audience is and using the best channels to reach that audience. So there were a couple of things that, that you mentioned, Elizabeth, that I want to follow up on. And one is that trusted source of information. And then also, I heard very clearly, you have to be very specific with your language. Mm -hmm. And what we always ask for at FMI, whenever we're, we're talking about consumer messaging, is to test the messages first. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about both of those aspects, because there's that trust, there's that connection with the person or the audience that, um, that kind of, um, you know, are you, are you a, a trusted source, but do you have a, a, a some kind of connection. I don't want to say emotional connection, but do you have a connection? Do you connect with them in some way? And then the information. It, are both equally important, or would you say that, that one outweighs the other? Because as a scientist, I can tell you it's very frustrating to me that if we just tell people accurate scientific information, it's not enough. It, it has not been enough that um, has failed us. We've seen it over decades. Um, just giving them scientifically accurate information has not been enough. So I, it, the trust has to be there. How do we do both? And I think this audience is perfectly positioned to provide both of those um, qualities in the communications that they push out around food safety education. Yeah, and I would say first with, with trust, one of the things to look at is really being a credible source of information. Um, so that means every piece of information that comes out from you or your agency, you have to feel you know, that it's accurate, that it is conveying the appropriate amount of risk to people, um, and, and to maintain that trust and to build that over time. And that, that isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. As we know, there is a lack of trust in a lot of institutions these days. Mm -hmm. And Mindy, you can go back to your days at Texas Tech. I don't want to put you on the spot for yeah. USDA since it's been such a short time. Yeah. But have you found that, that one outweighs the other or both equally as important to have that trust plus the quality and, and accuracy of the information that you're conveying? 
Well, I think it's, they're both important, but I really think, I mean, from my experience, it's, you know, really more if, if they know you personally. Okay. I mean, I, the trust factor is, is really important because uh, I think, uh, you know, I'll tell someone something, you know, oh, hey, this, you know, cook it to this temperature or don't let something sit out on the counter and they'll say, oh, but on, you know, Dr. Phil or whatever, I don't, you know, whatever it is, they said, don't do, you know, do it this way. And you have the accurate information, but, uh, you know, and I'm talking about a random person. Mm -hmm. But then if it's someone close to you, then they'll call and say, oh, hey, I know you know this. And I get those kind of questions on Facebook all the time, you know, like a, on a private message or like, oh, somebody told me that this was, you know, bad or, you know, cook your turkey in the dishwasher or whatever. <laughs> you know, you, I know y'all all hear those things and I'm like, no, that's not okay, you know. So they'll, they'll follow up with me because they have a personal relationship. So I think it, the trust is really big in making sure that the message comes across and, and they believe you. And then, you know, long term, if, if it plays out to be true, then that also helps as well. Okay. And Elizabeth, you also mentioned something else that I wanna go back to and that's that aspect of, everyone or every group seems to think that they're they're special in some way or they're an exception to the rule or their followers are an exception and they don't have to do the basics they don't have to tell people the basics they don't have to follow the rules basically um, so how can we as, as food safety educators manage that communicate that that you know when it comes to washing your hands everybody has to do it and by telling people to wash their hands, it should never be portrayed as be portrayed as, a, as an insult. It should never be taken as an insult. It's always it's just basic stuff that you know. If someone tells you to wash your hands, you go and do it. Um, but n no one's exempt from following appropriate food safety advice. How do we convey that? I don't have the answer, <laughs> mm -hmm. but how do we convey that? Because we've heard that over the last two days. Um, and you mentioned it in, in your summary just a couple minutes ago. How do we get that across to people that you do have to follow, you know, if appropriate advice, you do have to follow the rules? Sure. Or you're at risk, you're at a higher risk. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think some of that is, is gonna come with, with how we broach the subject and how we frame it and do we, frame it negatively, do we frame it positively? Um, and, and a lot of this gets back to knowing your audience too and how receptive they are to your message. If you understand their concerns, if you understand um, maybe why they practice something a certain way, then you can frame your message in a way that may be more acceptable to them. I think we, we've seen some research during this conference from those of you had, had talked to people who are doing very specific practices mm -hmm. and they've done it forever and it's never made me sick and I'm going to keep on doing it because why should I change it? Um, finding a, a good way to let them know that they're at risk either because of a change in their circumstance, um, a change in the risk factor of that food um, can be a way to get their attention. Um, just simply telling them do it because I say so is you know you're not you're not going to get worked. anywhere with that. Exactly. Yeah, or, I think you made a great point over lunch. You were telling me about when you have when people have a life change and there's a mm -hmm. teachable moment, and I mm -hmm. think that was just a great piece of insight about there's some times in people's lives where they're more receptive to receiving information and and getting a grasp of that, I think that would be, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, and, and I think there were some presentations earlier on life stages, looking at um, when people were older, uh, parents of young children. Um, those, those are all good, significant life change times when people's habits change, and it's a good time to approach them about developing new habits. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at how, um, corporate marketers work, they do choose those points to introduce their product or establish brand loyalty or to try to change brand loyalty because they know those are critical times for people to change behavior patterns and buying behaviors. All excellent points. Um, how has social media played into this? I mean, we, we use it as a tool. We use it to share information, but we've also seen it used in negative ways. 
So can you share with us, Elizabeth, as a, a health educator mm -hmm. and Mindy as a professor and now with your role at USDA, um, kind of share your thoughts about social media and, and how this audience, how we can, can use or um, kind of scan social media more appropriately in your opinions. I mean, social media is, is fascinating because you can learn so much about what people think from looking, if you have a Facebook page, especially where people can leave comments, what they're thinking um, either to general food safety messages or to outbreak messages. You um, can also see how misinformation is shared. I, um, some, some years back I managed um, some social media messages relating to vaccination, and you can imagine just what kind of kind of discussions there were on social media about that. Um, I think it, it's a great platform for getting your message out. It's not the best platform to reach everybody, and that goes back again to knowing who you're trying to reach. Yes, a, a huge majority of the U.S. population is on Facebook, but it varies with age, and what we're seeing is that younger people, especially, that's not the platform they're on. Um, I have um, teenagers as well. They got dragged kicking and screaming um, to Facebook when they went to college and they had a class of, of 20, 22 page that they had to join. Um, they're on Instagram, they're on Snapchat. Um, so that's where you need to be if you're trying to reach young adults as they're starting to form those cooking habits getting away from home. Um, for most other people, Facebook will will be the broadest um, channel to reach a social media audience until maybe another new channel comes along. Uh, we used Vine for a while. Vine has mm -hmm. gone away now. Um, that was the six second looping videos. Well, I, I, I think that Facebook and, and these other uh, entities are very important for sharing information. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll use it to share an outbreak, or you know, that, uh, or some story that's credible, and, and you you tr you maintain your own personal reputation. I was sitting here thinking about a specific instance, and um, back in Texas, the lady who you know boards our dogs had put up that she was making dog pet food, but she cooks it. You know, she makes mm -hmm. her own pet toppers, and and I just put a comment on this, and I was like, oh, I'm so glad you're cooking your your ground turkey and and she's like yes always to you know the right temperature and she made a comment well she has a lot of other followers because she does dog training and has these videos and i mean it started a storm mm -hmm. of no you can feed dogs you know raw pet food and you know and i mean it 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 got really ugly these people saying things and and you know and i use this was pre-January 2019. So, so, you know, and I was just like, okay, um, well, I'm, I, I know what I'm talking about. I was, and they were just like, I don't, I bet you've never done any research with, you know, with, you know, meat products. And I, you may be a scientist, but I bet you don't know anything about this. And, you know, so then I just start posting all links to, you know, papers that we have done specifically with pet food and then some outbreaks. And, and the lady was like, well, you know, never mind. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, it's like, I, I have some authority to know, but you know, so this lady didn't know me. And then, you know, the other lady who was making the dog toppers, and I was like, I would send her a personal message. I'm like, I'm so sorry that your, your post about dog food <laughs> turned into this, you know, bashing of, uh, of me saying, oh, it's good to cook it. But you know, people get very passionate about what they think is right. In this group, she said, this is a group of people who want to feed their dog raw, raw pet food, and they think that's mm -hmm. what their dog needs, and, and you know, so it is what it is, and it didn't matter what, basically what we said. So it, it can be a good platform, but we also have to keep our cool, too. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I mean, we, we, you know, look at the Facebook page, and we try and counter misinformation, or perhaps the Facebook community has already done that, but Definitely a good thing to keep in mind if you're using social media. So I think the, the risk perception and accurate information about that risk, from my perspective, and, and y'all can disagree with me or <laughs> agree with me, from my perspective, it's becoming more challenging um, to combat those voices out there 
that, that might have credibility in certain audiences. Um, and then when I mentioned at the beginning of when I started talking, you know, we have whole genome sequencing that can, can link illnesses that we can find an outbreak with an illness in 2019 and link it to an illness in 2018 and even 2017. And we would have never known that before, so that's just exploded. And we heard from Dr. Tokes yesterday that, that almost all 50 states now have whole genome sequence, sequencers um, in their state laboratories. So we're just going to see more and more of this. Um, and we also have more data about basically everything that's going on. So how do we put risk in perspective for those consumers. And Elizabeth, we were talking earlier today about um, the differences between the spinach outbreak in um, the, the late 2000s, and then we've had the romaine outbreaks of 2018, which I'm sure everyone here in this room lived through that and had multiple questions about that. And there was, there was a definite difference in consumer response questions that you received at CDC. I can tell you from FMI's point of view, Spinach, the market for spinach fell dramatically. Um, it took months, if not years, to come back. Some say that it hasn't completely returned to pre-outbreak levels. With Romaine, the reports that we were getting, especially after the fall outbreak, was that the bounce back was very quick. Consumers returned to Romaine lettuce very quickly. Our stores had high demand for it. The sales were high. We don't have the sales data in yet, but that was the anecdotal information that was coming to us. So there's a definite re difference in reactions of consumers. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you noticed with CDC, the questions that you received were, were different. And there were, there were more, you said there were more questions when there was less certainty and fewer questions when your messages were more specific and more certain. Yes, and that was just over the course of the various um, E. coli, romaine, and leafy greens mm -hmm. outbreaks last year. So not um, talking about reaction during the spinach Finish, outbreak, right. which was before my time there. Okay. Um, and I think one thing that I, I wanted to bring up was that reported foodborne outbreaks like these um, account for maybe 1% of all foodborne illness. And, and that's a real challenge with conveying risk effectively to consumers because there is the immediate risk of the food that's causing the outbreak that we want to give them very specific product action to take with it. But there is the continuing everyday risks. And if you, you look at studies of risk communication and when consumers are likely to decide there's less risk and you look at the factors involved with that, it's something familiar, it's something that they feel like they have some control over or that somebody can control. It is um, something that is chronic, it's kind of everywhere, and you know, food. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas the other part of that, when people do perceive themselves to be more at risk, it's an acute event. Um, there is a more perceived, you know, seriousness. There can be fatalities associated with that. And of course, we know there are with foodborne illness, but I think the public is still very likely just to think of it as an uncomfortable two or three days um, and not take it as seriously, say, as they might some other diseases. So you've got as far as risk communication goes, it's, it's a little bit tougher to get them to pay attention for the day in, day out messages mm -hmm. than it is to an outbreak message because there is a higher perception of risk. Um, at the same time, if we look at what consumers do when they come to our web pages and we look at data, um, I, I think the ones that tell them they're at higher risk when it's a ready to eat food, um, and perhaps a food that's not often associated with illness, we see a good bit more web traffic to those than when it is a food that they might already associate with an increased risk of illness. Okay. Um, so I, I, I do think a lot of our messages are getting across. There, there are certainly a lot of people who aren't doing things that we want them to do, but um, 
there, there are people who understand that they may be more likely to get a foodborne illness, say, from a raw protein food that's mishandled than a carton of ice cream, by and large, you know. Well, I think, you know, we're in the middle of, well, one has ended, but, you know, three major outbreak right. associated uh, instances with salmonella, and we have a beef, a chicken, and a turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, the chicken, salmonella infantis, was just closed, and, you know, we work closely with the CDC. We at FSIS have to look at it on both ends because we have our processor and then we have the consumer. And the Infantis uh, outbreak was never traced back to one single uh, poultry or chicken processor, uh, but you know we would find similar strains, you know, at multiple uh, chicken establishments, but it was never linked to one. I think that, and and so we had to have two messages. One is we had to go to the industry, and I'm still on this message, you know, with salmonella control and what can you can do, and I'm going to continue this with the the chicken and the turkey mm -hmm. industries, but you know, so we have some guidelines for controlling it on the industry side, but then also it became a teachable moment for our consumers. And I know like the turkey one was ongoing and it was near Thanksgiving. And I think uh, Carmen did some videos on don't wash your turkey and you know, just giving some, uh, some good guidelines for consumers and to get the message out again. You know, it's like, okay, this is a time, we know you could get sick, the risk is higher, so maybe they're going to be more receptive to this information. So I know that our, um, our consumer education group did a lot of, uh, of educational messages to get that word out to the consumers as well. So we have to take the approach from both, both angles uh, as far as risk goes. And we hope the risk in the industry comes down and that corresponds to what's going on with our consumers and we get those outbreaks under control. So we're still working on the turkey and beef, but mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, that we're hopeful that'll end soon. Mm -hmm. And I have almost 20 years experience in the food industry and I can tell you that the prevention side is is equal if not more important than the, the outreach and communication side. Um, I'm not going to minimize the importance of reaching out to consumers, but preventing contamination is, is the most effective way to make sure we, we have safe food. And the industry takes that very seriously and our goal is, is to not have contaminated food um, and but we do want to arm consumers with those messages in order to reduce their risk. Um, so it's, it's yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Because right. yeah, you're, it's like you want the food to be as clean as possible. Exactly. And we want our consumers to trust the industry, but then they also need to know that it's they that last have to, step. Yeah, handle, we don't yeah. want that contamination to happen right. um, in the home when it's in, within their control. Um, so from an industry, we do take that very seriously, and I want to convey that because we've been talking about consumer food safety education. Mm -hmm. um, the industry doesn't get a pass. We have to produce food that's pathogen-free. So I want to make that very clear. Um, we have some great ideas that have come in, so I want to go through some of these cards. Um, the first one I'm going to read is, is that the person, they try to pretend that they don't know everything about food safety when they're developing the messages. So they, they are putting themselves in the role of, of the consumer, the non-food safety expert, and then they also said to test the messages. I love that idea, changing your, your mindset, changing your framework um, in terms of, of message development. Um, another card says, more social media, change the perception and biases, um, coming down to the consumer's level, easier language, and finding language to um, to change the behavior. I think that's where, where we probably still need a little bit more research on what that actual connection is. Um, and then they, they said this is very, very true, and I want you to, to hear this. It, it, don't doesn't work, so you can't tell people to not do something. You have to tell them more about it, and I think mm -hmm. both of you have talked about that in terms of the, the why behind it, putting in perspective for them. I mean, everyone eats three meals a day, or you know, two and a half meals a day. Um, you know, it's not like cigarettes. It's not like something that we can completely avoid. We cannot avoid food and, and live life. We have to eat, yet there's inherent risk with anything we do. So I think that was um, 
an interesting way to, to put it mm -hmm. into perspective. But I, it, so both of these were saying to kind of put on the, the consumer's mindset and think about the messaging in that way. Um, another one says, from our research, to raise awareness and increase the knowledge using novel and interactive communication methods were very effective, and to change behavior using positive reinforcement coupled with peer influence were very effective. I love that. So I'm going to read that second one again. To change behavior using positive reinforcement coupled with peer influence were very effective. Yeah. Okay. How many, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an underlying tone of, of what both of you have said, but I think that's really important to, to put that into perspective. Um, another card is more hands-on demonstrations, um, actual you know, demonstrating in front of people, not just telling them to do something, but showing them how to do it. Um, using Play-Doh to explain pathogen growth um, is the example that they used on, on their card. Now, how does that work? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Come up and tell us after. Um, create companion media to, sup to supplement our current in use um, text using the guidance documents. So basically, um, companion media to, to text and um, the guidance documents. I'm not sure I understand that one, but um, I think it's maybe a, a, another document to go along with the technical document, perhaps, but a companion media tool um, to supplement is yeah, how I'm interpreting yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. That's um, another one is negotiating more plain talked and focused messaging with subject matter experts. Um, so that worked. And they specifically call out the Don't Wing It campaign. Um, that was a campaign, the, the partnership was involved. Um, Dr. Godwin, who spoke yesterday, um, was one of the PIs on that. And that was. Um, based on research, but it was also very simple language. So more plain talked, plain talk in, in the messaging. So connecting with that consumer. Um, and I will encourage consumer and or stakeholders related to e-commerce and or meal kits to follow new guidance on food safety practices when using these services. Look at safety um, on TV chef recipes. So that's what, what this um, ideal is, is about. And I think we learned a lot from Dr. Schaffner just a few minutes ago about the, um, the broad spectrum. And, and what I, I really liked about Dr. Schaffner's talk was that it's, it's e-commerce is changing dramatically. There are new forms, so we need to be very open to this. I know this is something USDA has been working on. I don't know if CDC has tackled this issue yet about kind of the new business models mm -hmm. and how do we communicate that or do we bring it back down into the basics? Mm -hmm. Do we put it in perspective of the basics? Yeah, so, I mean, for us regarding delivery foods, we have addressed that with a feature article that we um, rolled out last year and some social media messages. It is important to know you know, where the consumer is now, to be aware of what's changing and how they might buy or prepare food and make sure that you have appropriate messages for it. People really want to see themselves reflected in the messaging you're, aim, you're aiming at them. Not one message is gonna work for every person. Um, so somebody who's buying a meal kit and opening packages and assembling is gonna be in a different place than someone who is, you know, cooking a Thanksgiving turkey from scratch mm -hmm. with perhaps the amount of, of um, instructions they need and the guidance, even though they're yeah, the same basic four steps. There are complications with, you know, does that meal kit show up and sit on your doorstep in the sun for five hours mm -hmm. before you get home? Does it, um, last time we mail ordered food, it was a, um, the cardboard box arrived, ripped open with a couple of gel packs, and it was missing half the steaks, and some others were thawing. So, you know. <laughs> things go wrong. Things go wrong. And then what do you do when things go wrong? We probably right. should build in those messages, too, of how to handle that. 
what to do. And, and we did, mm -hmm. you know, um, although I understand sometimes it can be a little bit challenging working with some of the companies mm -hmm. um, to do that because there, it gets into was it the delivery service's fault or was it the company's mm -hmm. fault? And, and that's something for the consumer to be aware of is that they might not have recourse if they mm -hmm. paid, you know, a considerable amount of money for food and it arrives spoiled and unusable at the house. Exactly. But, you know, we tried to suggest, you know, have a neighbor take the food in for mm -hmm. you if you're not going to be home and you're expecting a delivery. So to give people some practical steps for what they could do if they're ordering that, as well as how to make sure the food arrives in safe condition. Okay. So what I want to do is give each of you just a couple of seconds to, with your take-home message. What do you want us to remember at when we get off the plane or on Monday morning when we get back to our offices, um, what is that one talking point that you really want to, to get across to this audience? Well, I, I'll start, I guess. She didn't prepare us for this. No, no. I didn't. I didn't no, even know this think question. That, <laughs> the, the main thing that I want to say is that every, your job is important. And remember that uh, you, what you did yesterday may not work tomorrow, and you have to stay on top of things, and, and what you do can save a life. And that's, that's basically it. And, and I'm here to support you where I am, and I've, I'm going to focus resources in this area, and it's really important to me. And I just want to thank you for listening and for being here and for talking and interacting with me. It's been a great, great conference. It's, it's wonderful. Thanks for having me. So. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I would say I think you guys are already doing a great job. Just keep doing it. Um, the fact that you're coming to conferences like this, you're doing research, you're sharing knowledge with others, you're learning new things. It's just such a, a, a great way to go back and really bring new ideas to what you're doing. Um, but at the same time, try stepping out of, out of your informed self or giving someone else to get you perspective on what you've been doing. Um, talk to your audiences when you can find them out in formal conversations in grocery stores or restaurants or wherever you work with people about what they know and what they don't know and try and use that as a sounding board for how your messages are getting across and um, you know could they be easier to understand could they be plainer um, are they giving the audience what they need in the way of food safety education you know where their knowledge gaps are those are excellent points I'd like to thank Dr. Bashirs and Elizabeth Green for for joining us for this last session and um, thank you very much. This has thank been very, you. very informative. And Shelly is going to wrap up. Wrap up. All right. Well, I do want to handle one of the most important things, which is to acknowledge the significant role that Hillary Thesmar played, not only in the partnership over many years, but in this conference in particular. As you see, she's not only co-chaired it, but she's helped facilitate a lot of it. Um, she is an expert, and she's also extremely capable and great leader of the partnership. So here's a little something for you, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, several people came up to me to tell me that, uh, that I should mention that the United Nations General Assembly has adopted a resolution proclaiming World Food Safety Day June 7th. So um, I just wanted to say that and that we will probably send out some material or give you some guidance on uh, resources and what some of the folks in the US are going to be doing around that. Um, there is a survey that may have already gone out, if, if not, it'll be out very, very shortly, about this conference. Please, please answer this survey so we can learn very shortly after this thing closes what you thought, uh, what your impressions were. There's a number of great questions there that's going to help inform what we do next. Uh, the conference presentations, you will have access to all of this, and we're going to have a password-protected web link, uh, that's going to come out to you very shortly, also by email, very shortly, not next week, but possibly uh, even this afternoon with this other email. All right. Um, 
Take care, Hillary. I want to thank Brittany Sagne and Shante Loretti. Are you both in here? They're probably working. <laughs> they are. They're the other partnership staff who helped who helped do this. Um, uh, I, I, I want to thank Kathy Means, who you'll hear from shortly. Also, she is the partnerships uh, chairman of the board. This board has worked very hard, and I think. Uh, many of them were here, and uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about after the conference, about making sure we keep up this momentum in serving you. Uh, finally, let me recognize that all of the federal agencies helped make this possible, the CDC, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Food Safety and Inspection Service, and National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Our uh, lead sponsors are Cargill, Costco Wholesale for this conference, the FMI Foundation, Nestle, the Produce Marketing Association, and Tyson Foods. Please help me give them uh, another round of applause. Uh, our, our gold level sponsors are the International Association for Food Protection, Public Supermarkets Charities, the Beef Checkoff, uh, our silver sponsors, the American Frozen Food Institute, the Association of Food and Drug Officials, Hormel Foods, Lando Lakes, McDonald's Corporation, NSF International, U.S. Poultry and Egg. So if you all don't understand how much these folks do want you to have the resources you need to do your work, I think that list is an indication of that level of support. All right, Kathy, thank you. So it's time to say goodbye, isn't it? For, for this time. I want to thank everybody who came, just all of you. This has been amazing. But I especially want to thank uh, the Board of Directors, the Program and Conference Planning Committee, the sponsors and partners, the presenters, the poster session people, and especially to Shelley, the staff, and Mary Kathleen and her staff uh, for making this all happen and seeming like it just doesn't take anything. Uh, all of us who are involved in conferences know it takes a lot to put on a conference like this. And so thank you, Shelley, and everybody who worked with you to make this happen. So if you like this conference, um, we really do want to hear from you. Uh, it's important that you let us know whether it's on the survey. We certainly want everyone to fill out the survey, but if you come up with some random thought or what, email anybody that you know you want to. You can find contact information on the website if you don't have Shelley's email already or something. So, um, so please let us know. This conference is here for you so that you get the take-home value that you need. One of the things I love most about this conference is the buzz and energy when you all get together and I see you sharing ideas and I share ideas and I get new ideas. All of that is just amazing to me. And, and when I hear things like the hand washing story, learned yesterday, emailed out last night, and put into place this morning, oh my gosh, that, I mean, that's the absolute ultimate. So when you do things from this, we'd like to know about that too. We love getting those kinds of stories about how this conference has impacted your work um, and the work that you do. Because what you do is incredible. You are making a huge difference in the lives of Americans um, by the work that you do on safe food handling. So I encourage you to stay engaged with the partnership However you're engaged, whatever it is, stay engaged with us, and together we can continue to evolve this and, and learn more. So thank you again for coming. Have safe travels home, and we'll see you next time.